Welcome class to chapter eight of Medieval Europe. Let's refresh our minds of what we learned in chapter seven before we dive into chapter eight. What were some of the key things that we learned? We learned about basically two individuals and their responsibilities, or I guess two groups of people really. We'll be like one, one individual and then a group of people. That's right, we learned about the manor lord or the lord of the estate or lord of the manor and then we also learned about serfs and their responsibility we learned that serfs were responsible of taking care of the land they were giving portions of the land from the lord and they took care of that land they made bread they got milk and eggs they made clothes and they were even some had the skills of blacksmith and made tools and swords they were also responsible of helping protect the land if they were ever under attack the Lord provided protection to the serfs. He gave them land and he provided protection. He also uh, was the one that provided law and order to the land and would punish anybody that wasn't doing what was according to the law. And so that is what we learned. Today we're gonna dive into chapter eight titled Life in a Castle. So before we start, let's talk about our focus objectives for today. As we read and after this chapter, I want you to be able to know how to describe the role of castles and providing protection during the Middle Ages, identifying specific castle features that would aid in its defense. We want to be able to describe life inside a castle and like usual, be able to understand the meaning of the chapter vocabulary words. And you already probably thought it, you get extra credit if you use one of the vocabulary words in a sentence and submit it and uh, below this assignment. So let's get into chapter eight and let's talk about um, life in a castle. So let's call attention to the big question. So why were castles important in the Middle Ages? So a lot of you probably have images or ideas of what a castle is. You could probably, you've probably read about them in books or seen them in movies. And so as we read this chapter, we're gonna learn about how some of those things are true, but how some of those things are fictitious, all right? So as we read, look for answers um, to, look for answers to the big question of why were castles important in the Middle Ages? Castles, dream and reality. You've probably heard fairy tales about kings and queens and castles. There's always something magical going on in the fairy tales. Wizards, witches, and fairy godmothers are likely to be hanging around the castle, casting and breaking spells. Do you think that really happened, or do you think that's more fictitious? Let's look at these pictures really quick. Here we have our gatehouse. Here's a drawbridge. Here's the outer wall of the castle. And if we scroll down, we can learn a little bit more about what is in the castle. So as we look at our caption right here, it's a castle in the Middle Ages was like a small city. So let's go up here. So here we have a kitchen, which is called the keep. And inside the keep is also the Lord's chamber. Over here we have towers. And then we also have the great hall. That's where the round table probably is in King Arthur. So castles are real. However, even if some of the characters in these stories are not, even today, you can see medieval castles all over Europe. In this chapter, me and you will learn why people built castles and what it's like to live in one. So castle fortress. And if we look a little ahead on this first sentence, we can see that fortress is our first vocabulary word. A fortress is a fort a place that has been built to be strong enough to provide protection. So castles were designed to be, uh, to provide protection. They were designed to be fortresses, they were really strong. So kings and some nobles built castles to defend themselves and their estates against attacks. The forts were usually built on high ground. This way, the defenders could look down on the attacking enemy. In the early Middle Ages, people built wooden forts with wooden fences around them. Surrounding the fence was a big ditch called a moat that was often filled with water, making it difficult to get into the castle. If you were attacking such a fort, what would you do? 
If you answered burn it, you would have made a good general in the Middle Ages. Wooden castles were easy to build, but they provided little protection against flaming arrows. Kings and nobles realized they needed to build castles out of stone to get any real protection from invaders. It was certainly a lot more work, but by the year 1000, many stone castles were being built in different parts of Europe. Definitely provide a lot more protection, definitely really a fortress. So what did a stone castle look like? Was it, what was it like to live and fight in one? So we're gonna read and find out a little bit more. Let's first read about castle construction. And just to recap, we learned that castles were built to provide protection. They were basically a city inside a castle, and so the castle was a fortress to provide protection to all those that lived in it. Okay, and we also learned that castles used to be built out of wood, but they weren't very good against any flaming objects, like flaming arrows. So they decided to build uh, castles out of stone. So let's learn how they did that. Put yourself in the place of a king or noble in the Middle Ages. You need to build a castle. What's the first thing you're going to think about? If you answer location, you get an A for good planning. A castle needed to be in a place that would be possible to defend. Have you ever wondered why many castles were built on hilltops? A hilltop was easier to defend. Soldiers could see their enemies coming. Castles had high watchtowers for spotting approaching enemies. The enemies had to march up the hill while soldiers in the castle used weapons against them from above. Many castles were surrounded by tall stone walls and a water-filled moat. Some castles had more than one moat and more than one wall. Drawbridges could be lowered or raised to create or remove a roadway over the moat. These extra walls and moats provided additional lines of defense. Some castles also had underground tunnels for moving soldiers between different parts of the castle. On the top of the walls, there were usually walkways, which from soldiers could shoot arrows or dump boulders and hot oil down on the attacking enemy. Ooh, saying hot oil made me. That would hurt. I think I would prefer the boulder. Within the castle walls was a central tower called a keep. Here's a little picture of a keep. Some of the area near a castle's keep was open courtyard. Other areas were covered. The keep was built to help people hold out for a long time against the enemy who surrounded the castle. In or near the keep were stables, workshops, a large oven, and a kitchen. There was a well for water and stalls for uh, farm animals. So a well is a hole dug deep into the ground to get water. There were also storerooms store where grains and other foods were kept. These stores were not unlimited, however. Many people, kings, nobles, servants, and soldiers lived inside a castle. Unless food and supplies were replaced, they would eventually be used up. The chickens would stop laying eggs, and the, and the cows would stop giving milk. Still, people could survive behind a castle's walls for months. Okay, so... Seems like what we just learned in the last chapter, inside the walls, they are very self-sufficient. They could last a lot of time inside the walls. They were protected and they had what they needed to live. Okay. So, let's continue to read Castles and War. So we learned how castles provided protection. Well, let's see how well they were used during protection. Castles were strong forts, but well armed. Patient, attacker, patient attackers could take a castle. The battering ram was one method, one method used by attackers. You know what a battering ram is? Anybody seen Lord of the Rings? And I think it's the third movie. Remember the orcs? slamming something into the gate that's a battering ram let's read a little bit more about it so battering rams or where many soldiers were required to hold up a huge log that was banged against the heavy iron-clad castle doors until the doors broke open battering down the door was difficult castle doors were strong and the men holding up the battering ram were under constant attack from defending soldiers high on the castle walls right dumping boulders and hot oil on them Whew. Attackers also shot flaming arrows into the keep. The walls made the walls may have been stone, but castles still had buildings within made out of wood. 
They also had hay in the stables and other items that could catch fire. Some attackers would dig tunnels under the stone walls and weaken them to the point of collapse. Nevertheless, since castles were so strong, direct attack nearly, near, sorry, rarely worked. So attacking, as we just read, at the walls or at the gate, it didn't really work very often. Most attackers relied on siege or blockade to win. And a siege, or, sorry, let's pause really quick. What is a siege? It's our next vocabulary word. So a siege is a battle strategy in which enemy soldiers surround a building or place so that those under attack cannot receive supplies, basically a blockade. So we learned that those inside the castle could last months with the provisions they had from eggs or cows, but if an enemy stayed outside for longer, they would be blocking more supplies or provisions coming in, and that is what a siege is. this so in a siege an attacking army would surround the castle so that food weapons and other supplies could not reach the people inside castles were prepared for sieges but after weeks their supplies would run out then the attackers would attempt to take over the castle attackers would siege towers tall wooden sorry attackers would you sorry attackers used siege towers which are tall wooden towers that rolled on wheels and could hold soldiers. These towers uh, were rolled up to the castle walls. Soldiers climbed up the towers and over the castle walls. Nevertheless, a castle had a strong fortress. A small army inside could hold out for quite a while against a much larger attacking force. Sometimes what decided the battle was action outside the castle. A king or noble under siege would try to get word to other vassals to come to his aid. So remember we learned about the feudal system. So maybe they would get, they could probably reach out to those that are higher, higher vassals, or they could reach out to the lower knights and lower lords to come to their help, to come help. An army surrounding the castle had to be prepared to fight both the castle troops and another army. Okay. So that is a lot of what could happen in a war on a castle. All right, life in a castle. So we learned how castles were built, the construction of castles. We learned how castles, how they were handled during a war. So now let's learn how it was like to live in a castle. Castles were very expensive to build, but that doesn't mean that they were very comfortable to live in. In fact, by today's standards, living in an early castle would have been awful. These castles were cold, drafty, and even smelly places. Ooh. Many people lived in a castle, but few of them had their own rooms or apartments. Most people lived and ate in the Great Hall, the largest room in the castle. In early castles, the king or noble and his family might have beds in the corner of the hall. Everyone else slept on the floor, often piling any clothes they happened to have under and over themselves for warmth. The Great Hall was also used for, mil for meals. Again, only very important people would probably have had chairs to sit in, and everyone else would have sat on long benches alongside tables. After everyone had eaten, the tables were put aside to provide room to sleep. So usually when we think about castles, we would think that everybody had like kind of their own hut or tent that they'd go live in. But in the early days, they actually all just slept and lived in the Great Hall. And so it wasn't a very fancy time living in castles. A lot of movies or books make, make it sound like it was very fancy and kind of nice and luxurious to live in a castle, but it, it wasn't. Um, all right, continue to read. Hope, hope you're following along with me. I know you guys are. Some early halls did not even have fireplaces. An open fire was, was built in a stone uh, hearth in the center of the room. So looking at this picture right here, here's a stone hearth. An open fire was built up, oh, sorry, it was probably more like camping than luxury living. It was hard to keep these castles clean. Dogs were allowed to run free in the Great Hall. There were no flush toilets, just closets built into the edges of the wall. Waste fell into pits or moats along the outside of the castle. The most privileged occasionally took baths and washed their hands, but servants did not have many sorry, excuse me. Servants did not have many chances to wash. So it was probably pretty stinky. 
Over time, castles did become more comfortable, especially for the kings and nobles who lived in them. I'm going to put my glasses on really quick. Fireplaces were added. More people had beds in their own bedrooms. Cold stone walls were hung with tapestries or even paneled with wood to cut down on drafts. So a tapestry is a hand-woven wall hanging that may depict people and or a scene. So kind of like a, a picture or a painting, but it was uh, a hand, hand-woven wall hanging. The Great Hall was still a center of activity, though. Musical performers, storytellers, and jugglers entertained people while they ate dinner and long into the evening, too. Various forms of entertainment were especially important during the dark winter nights, when the only source of light and warmth in the castle came from the fire in the Great Hall. Castles were so well constructed that many still stand nearly a thousand years after they were built. Castle building changed along with advances in weapons and warfare during the Middle Ages. So this isn't modern warfare, this is middle warfare. So warfare is the act of fighting a war. So as time went on, castles were advancing, especially in weapons and the ability to fight in war. During the early Middle Ages, foot soldiers used bows and arrows as their main weapons. You can see how those thick castle walls would be a good defense against a bow and arrow. And oh, a bow and an arrow is not going to go through a stone castle very well, right? Probably could have gone through a wooden castle, though. Especially a flaming arrow. But toward the end of the Middle Ages, the use of cannons in battle made it easy to break down a castle's wall. Can you imagine what it must be like must have been like to be inside a castle that was being hit by cannonballs. A flying ball coming at you, that will do some damage to the wall and to you. Okay, so um, that is it. Kind of short and sweet. So let's go back to the big question so you guys can be prepared. I know the vocabulary is pretty simple. You kind of scroll through and copy and paste it. But the big question requires a little bit more thinking, all right? Some critical thinking. Why were castles important in the Middle Ages? So some things that you can think about, some key points are is like, did castles provide protection? And who did provide protection for? Uh, who lived in the castle? How are the castles, why were they important to those that lived in the castle if an enemy came to, uh, came to take over it? And those are some key points for helping you answer your big question. That is it. Hope you enjoyed chapter eight. Make sure you're staying on top. Thanksgiving is coming up really quick. I know it seems kind of far away. It's like three weeks away right now, but I promise you it will come very fast. So do everything you can to stay caught up or get caught up. That way you can enjoy Thanksgiving break, not have to worry about homework that you have to do. And then when you come back from Thanksgiving break, it's just a few more weeks and then we have Christmas break. So do everything you can to get to stay caught up. If you're having um, any issues or, or struggles, please reach out to me or Mr. Williams. Um, with math, it could be me or Mr. Green, and we can try to help you out, okay? You guys are doing awesome. Keep it up, and I will see you in the next video.